Space Cowboys is brought to you by people like you on Patreon. Welcome back to the fourth episode of Space Cowboys. Yeah, welcome, Thais. And welcome, Herbert. Thais Roos. Yes. Herbert Blankenstein, that's us. Yes, that's us. And we have here Anthony Brown from Leiden Observatory. Welcome. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for talking to us. I want to go straight to the story of the week, because it's literally happening right now before me. So um, maybe people can hear this, but right now I'm looking at <laughs> a, a Blue Origin launch. Um, it's launching right now. It's launching as we speak here. That's beautiful. Here we ought to be live streaming, but we aren't. Yes, yes. <laughs> we're, we're working no. on a live stream, just like Blue Origin is, uh, but we're not. For our okay. new view, for our new listeners, we usually start with the story of the week, but this yeah. is happening as I'm looking at it. So that's I another lift off we have. Hey? Yeah, it's it's another <laughs> lift off. So it's it's the uh, Blue Origin is the um, the company the the space company of Jeff Bezos, the um, the CEO of Amazon, Amazon of course, yeah. and uh, it also has. A <laughs> Hear me. It also has a rocket that that flies out and lands back on Earth, just yes, as they, just they like do. SpaceX. Yeah. And for some reason, like whenever this this comes up, I'm like, hey, that that it exists and it works. Yeah. Like right now, I'm looking at it like, hey, it hasn't exploded. It works. It, it's a little <laughs> odd. It's a little odd looking. They can I think. actually launch a rocket. The, yeah, exactly. Don't don't you think it's a little odd looking? It looks different from other yeah. rockets that I yes, know. Yeah. And and well, more stubby. Stubby, thick, right? Said, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Little, like a little. Not very aerodynamic. Uh, no. <laughs> Do you know a lot about but rockets, Anthony? Not particularly. No. <laughs> <laughs> but for aesthetics, at least. Okay, but this one, it is a special one. It's mm -hmm. doing a suborbital fly flight, right? Uh, yes, Th this is... Uh, it's not it going, uh, going into, no. into orbit. No, uh, it's, it's suborbital and it, it is deploying something... Um, I would have to look into it. Actually, the fun. So that's one of the funny things. I I sort of like quickly tried to see. Okay, so what's up with it? Where are we? What are they doing? Yeah. I, I land on a 404 not found page I, for the news release. <laughs> it's it's a little odd. I, I, it's we can put something what, in the show notes. I, what, I have yeah yeah. So we're, if people are interested, go go look at what Blue Origin. They, they, they have, have they have cool stuff, but you never yeah. really know what 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 they're up to, right? There's well f for this flight. There's a page, and it sums up about eight experiments that are on board. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And I couldn't uh, reprodu reproduce this now, but uh, there the in the information is there. Yeah. And they have a couple of experiments for various, various companies and uh, and institutions in the states. But in general, it, the shine on Blue Origin is less than SpaceX, right? Yeah, it's right? less right? spectacular. Don't you guys agree? Maybe they, they yeah. do less PR or something. But of course, they do suborbital flights. They don't dock into the space station. They don't bring astronauts up. They don't do uh, supply missions. You know, so it's it's definitely a bit less sexy. Yeah, I are, guess. Are they a little bit behind SpaceX? Then? I think? wouldn't know, but probably yes. But uh, yeah, um, or maybe aiming for a different market, I guess as well. Yeah, yeah. space tourism. Yeah. Right. Tourism, okay. yeah, they said Th that that's what they do long term. Yeah, this year uh, supposedly the first people are gonna go up on a rocket like this. So on a new Shepard. I'll believe rocket. that when it takes place. Okay? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll, we'll check back in. Yeah. Right, right around then. <laughs> um, Anthony, what's what's your story of the week? Yeah, so uh, I'm, it's a bit strange. I'm a professional astronomer, but uh, yesterday, no, two days ago in the morning, I saw my first full uh, lunar eclipse. Uh, your lovely. first, yes. Your first uh, lunar eclipse. Indeed. Uh, of course, I've had uh, opportunities before, but I was always either asleep or uh, it was cloudy. So this was the first time it was uh, I was up in time to see it, and it was a very clear sky. So uh, yeah, it was spectacular, really beautiful. Beautiful, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. It's so such so weird looking that red moon. Yeah. Over yeah. Uh, over over the city, it's beautiful. Personally. Um, I thought it was a bit overdone in in uh, the press. Oh, the wolf red. Yeah, the super epic. <laughs> blood wolf moon or yes, something. Yes, Meaning indeed. just another lunar eclipse in January, <laughs> and the moon is slightly slightly larger than normal. Yeah, yeah. I know one of my friends uh, disappointedly <laughs> said uh, I'll be dead by the time of the next uh, lunar eclipse, and I said, well, this, that's because this is super blood wolf. <laughs> but don't worry about it. <laughs> there will be more in uh, in our lifetimes. So. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got to amp it up again, make it sexier, I guess. No. Okay. Maybe <laughs> as if a red moon is not sexy enough. Maybe I know. slightly more people have paid attention thanks maybe. to the bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. So that's all right. <laughs> that's right. And Herbert, well, what did you? I mean, by the way, uh, Anthony, amazing that you finally saw it. May, I, may you are. You've had decades of, of chance to Yeah, to because see a lunar eclipse is not very, very special, is it? Uh, no, it's not a rare uh, event. It's not rare, but, right? Uh, yeah. yeah but that's, it's that's just what happens. Yeah. I mean, I have to also say that uh, I'm, I'm not an astronomer who goes out regularly observing with a, with a telescope. I don't have patience for that. And, <laughs> and here it's too cold, uh, basically. So uh, well, Especially right now. Maybe the viewers at home can see the snow outside. It's well, terrible. Well, 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 well. It's barely freezing. Come on now. <laughs> I have my thermo underwear on. I hate this. I don't. <laughs> I have this, swe this, this sweater and I'm considering, considering taking it off because it's too <laughs> it's hot here. It's a little hot in, in here. Yeah. Yeah. Herbert, what's your story of the week? Well, my story is that I'm going to add a bit to Anthony's story mm -hmm. because I saw this uh, news item on space.com and it told me that during the eclipse there was a freaking meteorite impact on the moon. What? And it was photographed. Yes. No way. I have it I here on my this. screen. I'm going to lift up yeah. the laptop and okay. um, you can see it. Uh, let me... Uh, well, okay, here with the arrow. Yeah. And it's also in wow. the, the uh, larger picture somewhere around here. Mm -hmm. That's And space.com mentions a video that's supposed to be there uh, on that page. But I can't find it oh. on that page. And I'm wondering if that's something to do with my browser yeah, yeah, settings yeah. or something else. But um, there is a, a photograph in any case. And, and so many people were photographing it at that moment, yeah, I guess. Yeah, the chance yeah. of catching an impact, of course, is very high during a lunar eclipse because everyone is photographing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, okay. these things do happen. Uh, they regularly. do, yeah. of course. And impacts have been caught before. Yeah on photograph ah, but it's, it's funny this can, really can, makes it unique to me at mm, least yeah it suddenly is it was a very unique super blood wolf <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> the wolf smacked very smashed into the to say it all <laughs> in one go <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah yeah but the wolf exploded i thought th this uh, this makes it really interesting to me. it does mm -hmm. yeah and yeah no, we'll put I mean, it in the show notes too speaking you will put it in, in, in the show notes yeah, yeah. so very, very cool. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about Gaia, Gaia, the mission by ESA. Uh, really great mission, already going on for five years. Uh, and we're going to talk to uh, Anthony Brown from yes, Leiden Observatory. Are. And uh, you are uh, not only a researcher there, but you're also um, the head of the consortium that handles all the data. Yep. And how big is this consortium? Uh, it consists... Uh, at the moment of about uh, 420 members. Uh, and they just do the data Europe. processing? Uh, yes. So 420 right. people yep. are doing just the data processing of this one mission, that's which right. is huge. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's probably one of the biggest uh, astronomical consortia for space missions uh, out there. Uh, but uh, in the future, missions like uh, Euclid, uh, Plato will have even larger consortia. That's uh, already the case also. Uh, ground-based large surveys like the uh, Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is being constructed in Chile right now, they will image the whole southern sky every three days, more or less. The whole that southern will sky be will be, a, yeah. A huge yeah. consortium, yeah. Uh, both processing and analyzing uh, the data. So this is increasingly becoming normal in astronomy to work with these large groups because the instruments and uh, become more complex, more complex data, much more data is being gathered and yeah. you just need more people to, yeah. uh, to handle it. Yeah. First about the Gaia mission, what it yeah. tries to do, um, it basically tries to map the mil uh, our galaxy, the Milky Way. That's right. right? Yeah. It's, it, it's, it, you can't do it all, but at least it's trying, it's the first time attempt to sort of start cataloging the entire Milky Way, so that we know how it works, so that we can get to know the stars, see where they are, how the Milky Way rotates. Am I saying this all correctly? Yes, that's uh, that's correct. So uh, the 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 main aim of Gaia is to collect uh, distance measurements to stars. So of course we know where each star is on the sky. That's a, that's a relatively simple part of the measurement, and then uh, by Measuring repeatedly the position of the star over the sky over a period of five years, uh, we can actually see it move. And the movement consists of two components. Uh, one is the fact that a star is actually moving through space, uh, so it's moving also with respect to us, and that means that it uh, makes a tiny displacement on the sky every year, which you can't see with the naked eye, it's too, too small. 
but you can measure it with something like Gaia. And the other motion is the star appears to make a spiraling motion on, uh, across the sky. That, that we Due to the uh, yearly motion of the Earth around the sun. Correct. The parallax yeah. is Yes, it's that's called. the parallax. Yeah. And so, so, so I get this correctly, because I, I, I've seen multiple sort of like visualizations of this. Um, a star moves through the Milky Way, right? So all together in this big <coughs> whirlwind of stars, we go around the sun, but the sun also uh, goes around a supermassive black hole in the Milky Way. And then because all the planets move around the sun, the sun gets wobbly. It goes into like a, almost like a spiral. So that's, that's not the kind of motion. No, the star, the so I'm asking, I'm yeah. not yeah. No, telling. No, the, yeah. no, the point is that the, uh, because we are uh, making a yearly motion around the sun, if you imagine that you're looking at a particular star, let's say that light there in the, in the ceiling, uh, and if you walk around the room, the position of that light, if there were uh, a background, if there were no ceiling, the position of that we'll light see, would seem yeah. to change a little bit, simply because you're changing position. So yeah. it's a perspective effect. Uh, so you're circling the sun ah. like yeah. this. I mean, people can I'm hear circling me. The sun, going and so I can see that farther. star. Yeah, yeah. I the star makes a little circle on the sky, oh, and uh, the, c the com combination of your motion around the sun and the motion of the star through space uh, makes it look like it makes a spiral uh, motion. Uh, so this circle being stretched out along. And that's another clue to the distance of the star. The parallax is a direct measure of the distance uh, yeah. to the star, yeah. correct. Yeah. Yeah. So um, is there some bigger question behind all these measurements that Gaia does? Um, or is it simply an idea of uh, we want to know what is where and how it moves in all of the uh, galaxy? Uh, F certainly we would like to catalog everything mm -hmm. uh, because that uh, ultimately is the basis of all the understanding is knowing the, where things are, what their characteristics are. But the real motivation is that uh, we think we, we, we want to understand how our Milky Way came to be. Uh, so we know that the Milky Way uh, consists of a uh, thick a central part, which we call the bulge, which is also where the, the black hole uh, sits in the very center. Yeah. And the bulge is surrounded by a disk of stars, uh, and it has very nice uh, spiral arms uh, in the disk if you look at it from above. Uh, and this whole system is surrounded by, by what we call a halo. And a halo is, uh, consists of very old stars. Uh, also globular clusters can be found there, uh, dwarf galaxies, etc. Um, and the question is, how did this come to be? Why does the Milky Way look the way it does uh, today? Um, and we think this is that the galaxies build up gradually over time so that they start out uh, as small entities that merge together because of their uh, mutual gravity. And then slowly you build up bigger and bigger galaxies. Can you see evidence of that in our Milky Way? Well, that's that's the point. So we, uh, the only way we can see the evidence of that is by actually measuring the distances and motions uh, of stars. So you cannot simply take a picture of the sky and see where, for example, the remnants of a recent uh, merger between the Milky Way and a smaller galaxy are. You really need to know the motions of the stars because you can uh, group stars together because they're all moving in the same orbit, and that uh, reflects in particular uh, characteristics of the of the measured uh, motions. So measuring these distances and motions, uh, it allows you to get the get the real 3D uh, space motion. Um, uh, that allows you to group the stars in into um, uh, different original building blocks of the Milky Way. And then the other thing that Gaia does is it also gathers um, uh, information on the stars themselves. So it measures their colors uh, with high accuracy, and it also measures. Uh, how how fast they're moving uh, towards us or away from us. That component of motion cannot be measured by looking at the positions of the stars. Uh, you have to do that separately uh, using the Doppler effect in the, on on the spectrum of the of the stars. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and and the the measurement of the colors serves to characterize the stars. So you can then figure out uh, what is the temperature of the star, uh, what is the luminosity. Um, uh, what is the uh, chemical composition, or at least a very rough indication of it. Okay. Um, and ultimately, this, this kind of information, together with the distance, can be used to figure out how old stars are. And what we want to do is we want to build up the history of the Milky Way. And of course, we need to know how old things are. Otherwise, you cannot do any kind of archaeology. You need to know uh, how deep down yeah. in, uh, in the layers. <laughs> in the Milky Way are. archaeology. That's yeah, a, that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a niche. I remember <laughs> a satellite that did more or less the same. It mm -hmm. was called Hipparchos. Yes. Hipparchos? Yes. Also by uh, ESA? Yeah. Yeah, okay. and it was um, somewhere the, around 1990. Is that right? Maybe it the 80s? It was launched in 89. Uh, 89, yeah. right. Yeah, and, yeah. and this was a first attempt to map the Milky Way. That yeah. was a, 
a great story because um, I was uh, I wasn't there when it was launched, uh, I, but I did visit uh, Kourou in G uh, French Guiana when it was built up, and so I, I, I followed this project. And when Hipparchus was launched, it uh, got stuck in the wrong orbit. Oh, <laughs> and somehow they managed to uh, get all the uh, mission objectives done. And I, I believe even more. Yep. Can you tell us a bit ab about that? W were you uh, in astronomy uh, at I all was when, when just, this uh, happened? I started studying because astronomy I'm slightly in, older, I in think. '87, uh, yeah. so just before Hipparchus was uh, was launched. I do remember one of our uh, staff members running around very grumpily. <laughs> uh, after launch because of the wrong uh, orbit. Yeah. Um, and uh, so what happened is that uh, Hipparchus was supposed to go in a geostationary orbit. Yeah. Um, and it got stuck in some elliptical one, orbit. Yeah. It was first put in an elliptical transfer orbit and then the uh, rocket engine that was supposed to fire failed to fire and so it got stuck in that orbit. Now, this was not in principle uh, a problem uh, for, the, for the mission because all you need to know is the exact orbit, which you can calibrate from the mission data itself. Uh, but the fear was that because Hipparchus was going through the radiation belts every day, uh, every few hours in fact, that it would be damaged so quickly that the mission would just simply not, uh, not run long enough. Now, that in the end turned out not to be the case. Um, and indeed, they managed to do a factor of two better than what they promised originally in terms wow. of the yeah. precision that they uh, that they achieved. And so Hipparchus measured <coughs> the same things as Gaia, uh, um, so uh, less accurately, I suppose. And proper motions, less accurately, more nineties, and, yeah. and for about a hundred thousand stars. And at the time, it was a huge jump because we had uh, was, direct yeah. distances measured for a few thousand stars maybe, and Hipparchus immediately uh, added a factor of 10 and, and with incredible precision um, at the time. Uh, and Gaia is now going a factor of 100 better than Hipparchus in terms of precision and a factor 10,000 more stars because we're well over a billion stars. That yeah, one billion stars. I, I saw the figure <coughs> somewhere in a publication that I read. It was 1.6 billion, but it was down to the last Digit. Yes, we track every star. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have an exact count. Yeah. There's some exact count. And I forgot to, to write it down, so I can't quote it right now. Do you know it by heart, the no, number? No, not by heart, but perhaps I can. You're going to look at it. <laughs> yeah, look at, look at what that is. Do you have a live app for that? And <laughs> there is actually a Gaia app. Um, really? Oh, yeah. yeah. It, sure doesn't, uh, it doesn't <laughs> tell you, I think, what's exactly in the catalog, but it tells you how much data has been downloaded and what the mission wow. uh, status is, etc. Uh, how, many, how many stars in the Milky Way, you think? How many stars there are in total in the Milky Way? Yeah, yeah uh, sort of. Let's <coughs> say uh, 200 to 400 million, uh, 400 billion. 200 stars. to 400. I mean, that's that's a factor of two uncertainty. Oops. Yes, we don't uh, know it much more uh, really? than that. This is a combination of uncertainty on the total mass of the Milky Way uh, and on how the mass is distributed over the various stars. If you have lots of small stars, of course, you have more stars than if you have lots of yeah, massive and, stars. And so Gaia has one about one. 0.6, so not, not even 1%. Not even 1%. 1%. Yes, that's, wow. that's correct. It's one <laughs> and it's been looking for five years? Uh, it is. It will come up to five years of observations in July. Uh, but the, the length of time doesn't increase or decrease the number of observations. So we observe everything that we can see out to uh, a brightness measure called magnitude 20. And this is about uh, 800,000 times fainter than what you can see with your naked eye. Um, and we simply measure every every point source in the sky out to that uh, limit, and that okay. will always stay uh, the same. So uh, we can we we don't go any deeper because we measure. So longer, the one point so. six billion, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Yeah, look yeah. it up. Um, yeah, it's, it's um, the same. These stars will be followed for the next years to come, mm -hmm. and no other. Uh, that's correct. We we keep following. The figure will stay the, the same. The same. The number stars. will stay the same. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's it's such a huge number it's it, it, it's it's almost insane it's that incredible even, yeah that even just the undertaking itself that just map it all but the good news is there's still room for improvement for next mission yeah yeah I'm <laughs> that's true i'm already thinking so about the, the next uh, next mission there we go there here's we go the infographic with one the billion six hundred and ninety two million is this live is this live <laughs> nineteen thousand one hundred and thirty five okay that's the number wow Sorry, one point. Learn this by heart. Yeah, one bill, one billion six hundred ninety-two million nine hundred nineteen thousand one hundred thirty-five. That's a lot of stars. That's but yes, it's something. only a fraction of what, what, 
uh, it's going on. And what's, what's all the other things that we're seeing? Red color, blue color. So that says something about its color, right? That you yeah, also so know if that. We, if we go through the various circles, so the total catalog is about 1.7 billion stars. That's this here in the blue. And for those stars, we know the position on the sky to very high accuracy, and we know their brightness, so mm -hmm. the apparent brightness. Okay. So and that's the basis. That's the basis. That's the, what you would call a sky map, essentially. Um, yeah. Now, this orange uh, circle over here represents about 1.4, uh, well, 1.3 billion stars. And for those stars, we have actually measured the uh, parallax. So we know the distance to these stars. So we have, for a fraction of the stars, we didn't have enough measurements or they were too faint mm -hmm. uh, yet uh, at, at this stage uh, for the measurements to be good enough to make a parallax. Okay. For this more or less the same subset, we also have measured colors of the stars. So Gaia carries on board two uh, prisms that split the light into, uh, into, into tiny rainbows effectively. And then we can measure the spectrum at low resolution. But for this data release, we just summed up the light in the two that we get through the two prisms. So one in a blue, mm -hmm. uh, there's a blue band uh, covering the blue half of the optical uh, wavelength range and a red, a red band covering the, the other half. And this tells us enough to say something about the temperature of the star, uh, uh, luminosity, etc. And is it enough to like fully classify them into the... Not enough to, to classify them in yeah. detail, but yeah. what we can say is, uh, and this is this circle over here, so we have for 160 million stars, we have uh, a good estimate of the uh, effective temperature, so the, the uh, well, roughly speaking, the surface temperature of the star. Mm -hmm. And then for, the, for a similar number, a, about 80 million, we know something about how much dust there is between us and the star, so the dust makes Even the star... That looks uh, redder than it should be uh, and we can estimate that from the colors and the, and the parallax and we also you can also calculate the luminosity of the star and its radius also all from this uh, information mm -hmm. now you see a small circle over here uh, the to green lower, one. Lower I, I can't numbers. even see it the, the people at home can't 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 see it this is a, and this so we're going through like a whole list of what sort of stars you found right of whatever. No, this, is, this is the the data contents of the, catalog. the data content yeah, yeah just saying what what what's in the data so uh, this circle here uh, represents the stars for which we have measured a radial velocity so that means we can see that they're coming towards us or moving away from us and this is done with a higher resolution spectrograph on board uh, where you can actually see the individual absorption lines of the stars and by looking at how they shift you can measure how fast the star is moving in the in the line of sight because the proper motion that we measure uh, that's this bigger circle is only the motion across the sky and we need to know the other component to get the 3d motion yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and this is for seven million stars so that's a very small fraction of the total catalog and one reason the main reason is that the spectrograph can only go to uh, a much brighter limit than the than the rest of the mission and for this particular release, we focused on the very brightest stars out to magnitude 12. Uh, but it's still 7 million radio velocity. So it's the most radio velocity ever collected by a single instrument. And this only represents the first two, less than the first two years of data. So that's already a very impressive uh, feat. Yeah. And this is one of the data sets in combination, of course, with the parallax and the proper motion that is most used at the moment to uh, analyze the Gaia data. Yeah. Now here we see a very small circle. That represents about 550,000 stars. Uh, what Gaia does is it measures the stars repeatedly over the course of five years. So each star on average gets measured about 70 times. And that means that we also... In those five years, 70 those times. Five years, yep. yeah. mm -hmm. And so that means that we also know uh, whether the star is varying in brightness because we constantly can compare uh, the brightness at one moment to, to another. And uh, almost uh, every star is actually varying in brightness, but most of them at a very low level. But there are also stars that are changing very significantly in brightness. One example is the star Myra, uh, which really changes uh, by factors over the course of, uh, of a year and a half uh, or so in, uh, in brightness. And there are many more of those examples. And the nice thing about variable stars is that uh, for some types, if you know how often they vary, you know their intrinsic luminosity, and that means you can estimate distances to them very easily. Oh, okay. And of course, these, these kinds of uh, what we call standard candles uh, have to be calibrated by parallax measurements, because you need to know at the distance to at least one of them to, to actually calibrate this relation between the period of variation and their um, luminosity. Mm -hmm. So we have light curves, so time series of, of brightness measurements for uh, 550,000 stars. And in the future, this will be much more. We, we estimate that there must be tens of millions of stars in the catalog that uh, are varying sufficiently for us to make a light curve, but that will come in later uh, releases. And then the very smallest circle here, uh, that represents not stars, but uh, asteroids in the solar system. Oh. Uh, about 14,000 of them. Accidentally, you recorded a whole bunch of asteroids. Yeah, yeah so Gaia, <laughs> Gaia looks at every, everything, yeah, well, everything yeah. that is a point source in the sky. 
Mm. So that means also uh, quasars, for example, or cores of uh, very far away galaxies, but also asteroids in the solar system. Um, and the good thing here is that the uh, astrometry of the asteroids, so the position measurements at every uh, point in time, are the most accurate ever done for uh, for asteroids. So we get extremely accurate orbits uh, for these uh, for these objects. And in fact, for these objects that have been measured uh, for only uh, two years, uh, for some of them, the orbit just on the base of those two years is of better quality than the measurements from the past hundred years uh, combined. So Perfect. these are known asteroids; they've been measured before and. Uh, and Gaia will certainly also discover new ones. And in the end, we will probably have a catalog of around 350,000 asteroids. And the beauty there is not only uh, extremely accurate orbit determination, but we also get all the colors because we measure uh, also ah. the colors for the asteroids, just like we do for the stars. Hmm. And it means you can also classify asteroids into different types. So depending on the composition, the, the, the way they reflect the solar light is a bit different. And it's, does this it's, have a any it's a side mission. It sounds yeah, like a side yeah. mission. Yeah. Does this have any relevance to uh, uh, possible collisions with Earth, for instance? Yes. So uh, Gaia can... Uh, uh, see in directions uh, at any one time where where we cannot look from earth we can only look towards the night side of course to monitor for near earth objects and gaia can look at uh, right angles away from that in both directions oh yeah mm. and a bit closer to the sun so it can catch uh, near earth objects at uh, moments that in their orbit where we wouldn't see them from the from the earth but you can see them from gaia uh, so uh, what we have in place also at the moment is a is a system that goes through the observations every day. And if we think we found a new asteroid and we every now and then find one, um, it, it may be that this particular asteroid has an orbit which is oriented such that Gaia will just never see it again due to the way we uh, monitor the sky. And so it's very important to immediately follow up uh, the observations on this asteroid. And so what we do is we send out an alert to the community. Hey, we think we found a new asteroid and we can predict for every telescope on Earth exactly where the asteroid will be over the next days and weeks and so that uh, observers can go out and try to oh, catch cool. it and then you get a better uh, orbit determination very cool and, and, we, and just for my understanding about about Ga about Gaia and what it, what it does what it can see is it is it basically just our li the little circle around uh, where we are that we can see or is there something that that you can look deeper into the Milky Way for some reason because stars are more luminous or or, or something else is it, is it just our little corner of the galaxy that you can see or is there more uh, <clears throat> yeah there is uh, there is more let me see if i can mm -hmm. pull up an image we have to put a lot in the show notes today we yeah. do <laughs> <laughs> i'm not sure are you keeping track herbert not very much <laughs> no, no. the gaia app i have uh, the gaia app yeah yeah, yeah. it's probably all in, in, yes. in the gaia app and this chart that anthony has he well he, i suppose he's going to give us the url yeah I yeah can, yeah or yeah, exactly. send you the images or uh, yeah. yeah because uh, sometimes I, i've seen this this picture of um, the milky way um how far our radio signals have traveled since the invention of, of radio okay and it's like this super super tiny circle around where we are yeah, in the we milky haven't way come very far we haven't come very far and I'm, I'm just wondering if um if you if you look out at the milky way at night um your 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 look well here in the northern hemisphere we can't look into the milky way we're looking out of the milky way sort of right yeah um if if that is what you uh what you're measuring too all right so okay here's uh, a nice picture i'm just yeah. describing it what i'm seeing i'm seeing the milky just way from top sort of view, a, a you top see view spiral arms yeah yep. it's, so it's fake because we've never seen the top view of we, the milky way of course there. for the time being no <laughs> and then i see this one point that's very bright over here yeah and then it goes and then it, it sort of gradients out into less yeah so the so the background image is an artist impression of the milky way we think it might look like this but we're not sure i mean this is something we want to find out actually with gaia um, and what you see is uh, the middle part is a bit reddish. Uh, if you look at the background image, that's what I called the bulge earlier, which is also where the center of the Milky Way is with the supermassive black hole. Yeah. And the sun sits in the middle of this uh, greenish purplish region, about uh, 30,000 light years away from the galactic center. About halfway the rim of the galaxy. Yeah, more yeah. or less. We're sort of in a in a side arm. We're not all the way on the end, but we're sort of like halfway towards. Yeah, we're in the we're suburbs. Not a very special place. No, not a very special place. No. Not suburban. We knew that. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so sort of in between two spiral arms. We think. Okay. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so um, we're, we're it's more there's more countryside where we are. <laughs> <laughs> So what you're seeing is the the false color part, uh, the the what which goes from purple to green to yellow to red, etc. That is the density of the the predicted density of the stars that we see with Gaia, 
Most of them are concentrated around the sun, and that's because stars are typically uh, much fainter than the sun. So if we want to see them, they, they have to be close to us. Um, so we are covering with Gaia about a quarter of the whole Milky Way disk at, at a quarter. Uh, that's a lot. Relatively so. high uh, density, yeah. but in fact, Gaia can see stars all over the Milky Way. Depending on the type of star you're looking at, you can see it all the way to the other end of the galaxy. And we even measure stars in the Andromeda Nebula, which is a galaxy about uh, two million light years away from from us. And Accidentally, or accidentally, that's, because uh, that's funny. Uh, we we simply say we we measure. Every point source that is bright enough, so brighter than magnitude 20, and it, it will enter our uh, detection si the system and get followed on board, and we collect the measurements. But that should be giants if you can see them at two, uh, what was it again, two million light years yeah. away? Yeah, so these will indeed be typically the, uh, the, the very bright, uh, yeah. massive stars uh, that we see. And sometimes, of course, you might have a star cluster, which to us looks like a point, uh, but in yeah. fact is a, is a collection of, of stars. Okay, and just again, very silly question, just for my understanding. If a star is on the other side of the Milky Way for us, how many million light, year, light years is away from us? No, the star, well, we are uh, located at about 30,000 light years, and the whole Milky Way has a diameter of about uh, 100,000 light years. 100,000 light years, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. I, I, thought that, I, th to get there. I thought you said 2 million or something. I was no, no, that's, that's, that's Andromeda, of that's course. The Andromeda yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 that's right. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I okay. knew that. <laughs> so just to <laughs> compare where we were with Hipparchos, uh, Hipparchos surveyed basically only the central uh, purple area about uh, a couple Super of small hundred dots light years almost. around oh, right. the sun which is which was accurately mapped by Hipparchus uh, and Gaia is extending this essentially all, all over the, the Milky Way so it's really an enormous uh, step forward in our in our knowledge yeah. Of, yeah. Uh, of the Milky Way. Now Gaia was launched in 2013 right? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah and you told us there's this five year five year period in which data will be collected. Hasn't these haven't these five years passed now? Um, just about the um, uh, the launch was in December 2013, and uh, we spent half a year commissioning okay. the spacecraft, so checking out the systems. So we've been observing since July 2014. So this July 2019 will be the end of the nominal uh, mission lifetime of Gaia. Right. Um, but ESA has extended it to the end of 2020, uh, and uh, also there's a preliminary uh, permission to go on until 2022. Um, and we know that we can go on uh, at least until the middle of 2024. Um, and then you mean because um, uh, fuel wise, yes. Ah. So, so the we have two uh, systems on board for uh, propulsion. One is the normal uh, propulsion to m maintain the orbit of the satellite or do rough maneuvers. Yeah. That's fuel enough for decades. Uh, but we also have a system of micro thrusters on board, and they're capable of uh, delivering uh, micro Newton thrusts, so, so very, very <laughs> tiny. And they are used to very accurately control the spin rate of the spacecraft. All right. And, and these are ion motors? No, that's cold gas. Uh, cold motor. gas. Yeah. So, and then this uh, cold gas, of course, is limited. Uh, I think we took on board. Um, well over 50 kilos. So uh, that's just like releasing a puff of air and yeah. getting some thrust from, the, from yes, that? Yes, exactly. Okay, yeah. yeah. And we use about 12 grams a day of this uh, cold gas, and uh, and that's a fairly accurate measurement. Uh, we can estimate that from very in various ways, and then if you know how much was in the tank to begin with, you can extrapolate how long. Uh, 12 grams a day? Roughly, yeah. Okay. Over years and years, how, how many kilos of this stuff uh, are there on board? I think we started with uh, between 50 and 60 kilos. Uh, All right. How big is Gaia anyway? Uh, so the um, uh, let's let's look at an image of Gaia. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the easiest. Usually they're like a car. I'm guessing yeah. two meters tall. Two meters it's, tall? It's uh, three meters tall. Okay, yeah. that's good, good enough. Three, three, three <laughs> meters tall, yeah. If I'm getting within a factor of 10, I'm proud <laughs> yeah, of myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. No. Oh, yeah. And you, sh and you should be. And you should be. And you said, so ESA has extended the uh, the mission, uh, right? Just just now. What does that give you? What, is the, what does it give you extra? What can you do in the next few years that you... Um, yeah, more precision. Yeah, let's get back to that question just now. Here's yeah. the image of Gaia. Oh, look at it. It looks like a pancake with a cylinder in the middle. Yeah. 
Ja, yeah, but it, some people will like? say That's top hat. That's the molasses. Uh, 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 no, <laughs> <laughs> so the diameter of the sun shield, uh, the di the big disc, is 10 meters. Um, and it's, it blocks uh, the sun. It's a yeah. sun shield. Yes, so the, sun the sun is, is behind the, pancake the, the solar shield. panels yeah. uh, on the other the side. The solar panels course. are on, on the other side, right. and yeah. uh, the sun shield uh, protects the uh, the openings of the two telescopes. So we it looks like a mushroom yeah. on, uh, upside down, like an upside down mushroom. And so the okay. top of the mushroom has solar panels, and blocks the sun at the same time okay. yeah and then we the don't need that in the show so in the show notes no no i'm we just describing it yeah, yeah yeah and so then the stem so we're now talking about the stem of the mush of the of the mushroom of the uh, upside down mushroom that has all the instruments yes yeah. so there's a uh, in in the stem there are two openings uh, to let the light in and we have two telescopes on board and we're looking at two um, uh, lines of sight on the sky uh, at the same time separated by about 106 degrees um, and that's the fundamental trick we use to make sure that the uh, parallax measurements we make are on an absolute scale, so that uh, we don't have to calibrate it in principle against uh, against anything else. Um, yeah, and so the spacecraft itself is, is three meters tall, weighs about uh, two tons. It's a it's a large, uh, it's a hefty spacecraft. Yeah. 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 So if you could stand over there, you would just yeah, you would just not be able to reach the top. You can't. You wouldn't be able to climb I on would. top of it. You would? Yeah, yeah three meters? You can no, climb on no, top of three meters? meters? No, 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 no. No, I was thinking... If I would help you my, up, my first you would be able to climb on it. I, I could do that, but not three <laughs> not meters. Not three no, meters, no. You're right, you're yeah, right. Yeah, if you're ever in uh, the position to be at the uh, European Space Astronomy Center near Madrid, uh, which is where all the space astronomy missions are run uh, from, mm -hmm. uh, there's a one-to-one -one model of Gaia cool. uh, sitting there. It's uh, it's outside. It was actually built uh, in, uh, in Lisse, this model and oh, and here in Holland, by, yeah. Uh, wow. yeah, beautiful in, in spring with the tulips. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. where all the tourists go when 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 it's spring, right, Lisa? Sure. And but they also build spacecraft models. Apparently, so they uh, grow tulips and build spacecraft. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> I didn't spacecraft know that. models. I didn't know that either. Hey, but um, <laughs> launch in 2013. Uh, some preliminary work before it really got to work, yeah. the, the satellite. Um, there was a first data set, I don't rem remember when. There was a second uh, middle of last year, I think. Yeah, so the first uh, release was in September 2016. And right. uh, then last year, on April 25, was the second release. And the next will be in the middle of this year, uh, July? No, 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 in 2021. Uh, 2021? Yeah, yeah. So, okay. And then you have to get to work with all that data. Uh, then uh, the, the astronomical community gets to work with all the published uh, data and do the science. So the only thing we deliver is the is, is we turn the raw telemetry of the spacecraft into uh, data that the astronomers can actually interpret. Uh, so the catalog, uh, in, in effect, and uh, that gets published immediately without us doing anything with it. So it's uh, it's really open science, uh, literally. So the only thing we do is we process the raw data and then we immediately provide it to the community. So they can do science with it. Yeah, and every next data set just gives you more precision. Is that right? It gives you more precision, but also more uh, types of data. So um, what I mentioned before about the colors of the star uh, stars is that right now we have only a rough measurement. We can tell you it's blue or it's red mm -hmm. or something in between, but we are actually measuring much more detail than that. So we have these two uh, prism spectra, which have uh, too low resolution to do detailed spectroscopic work, but they have enough resolution solution that you can say uh, much more about the stars than what we are doing now. Uh, so that's one of the things we're adding in the in the next release is that we analyze those spectra to make better uh, classifications of the stars to, to better characterize them. Um, the, the other the other addition next time is uh, if we follow a star on the sky and we see its uh, spiral motion, Sometimes you see that it doesn't exactly follow the spiral motion. It makes little deviations. And these, this is the sign that there is something in orbit around the star. Like it could a planet. Be oh, yeah. A planet. Ooh. It could be another star. We talked I about that last week. Exoplanets. Exoplanets. Was it last week? That was two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Yeah. With Ingeloos Tenkate. Yeah. So look up that edition of yeah, uh, Space Cowboys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But th this um, Gaia satellite does work that's relevant to exoplanets as well. Yes, so the uh, both from the astrometric measurements, so the position measurements of stars in the sky, what I just described, and from the uh, radial velocity measurements that we do, we can uh, find uh, uh, double stars. Uh, and if the uh, thing that is in orbit around the star is small enough, it will be a planet. Uh, the planets will mostly come from the astrometric uh, measurements because they're, they're the only ones precise uh, uh, enough. Um, and we think that we'll, based on the five years data, we will find 
maybe 20,000 star, uh, sorry, yeah, stars with planets around them, uh, down to um, Jupiter mass. So we can only find big planets, not mm -hmm. the very small ones. Yeah. And Otherwise, it doesn't wobble enough. And one of yeah. the advantages of extending the mission to 10 years is that we will probably increase then the number of planets to 70,000. That's the current estimate that we uh, that we have. Um, and uh, to come back to this to this the reasons for this extension. Um, of course, if you double the lifetime, you collect twice as many photons. Uh, so that means that everything uh, is 40% more precise. Now that by itself would not be the mo uh, enough motivation to, to double the lifetime. But if you double the lifetime, you also measure the motions of stars much more accurately. Because the longer you measure, uh, the better you have a handle on the actual uh, velocity of the star across the sky. So there you gain a factor of almost three in the in the the proper motions of the stars so that's very interesting because it's often uh, stars that are very far away in for example dwarf galaxies or or streams of stars that are remnants of dwarf galaxies that we are interested in and then the proper motion precision is uh, is, is is crucial uh, and if you're interested in things like double stars or planets then you can gain factors of up to 20 by in precision by by doubling uh, the lifetime and is the idea to follow up on all, on all the data that you have now is is the idea to then look at more let's say broad uh, implications of these things or will we maybe uh, so so this is how the milky way uh, moves or this is what dark matter does or is it more trying to find peculiar things so that we can zoom in at one star to figure out maybe to, to like what will you use this data for from like the bigger questions or can we use them individually almost as it well it is used for both so mm -hmm. uh, gaia in fact has impact on every area of astronomy uh, that's that's the beauty of the mission when i uh, go around now uh, to present uh, gaia to colleagues and give them an overview of uh, of all the science that is being done with the mission, I constantly jump from one topic to another, from one slide to the next, because there's so many things you can uh, you can do with Gaia. So yes, we can look at the bigger picture. Uh, the goal being understanding the Milky Way. One of one aspect of that is the distribution of dark matter, which we can figure out by looking at the motions uh, of the stars. Uh, but there are also people who are interested in very specific uh, topics. So there was a very nice paper in Nature uh, a couple of weeks ago by a group from uh, the University of Warwick in England. They used Gaia data to show that for the first time now we can actually see that um, in what we call white dwarfs, these are remnants of stars like the sun, and they're, they're very small, they're about the size of the Earth, but they're as massive as the sun, so they're extremely dense uh, stars. Hmm. Um, and they don't produce any um, energy anymore in the sense that they don't burn um, hydrogen or helium or et cetera in their interior. So that uh, the only thing they do is they cool down over the course of time. On their way to becoming neutron stars. No, they won't become neutron stars. Okay. They will just cool down. And Never mind. <laughs> and, Silly you. And, and sit Sorry. there. And, and yeah. so, but the white dwarf but is just for my understanding now that we're at it. Uh, so it has burned up all its hyd hydrogen. Yeah. Uh, that has that has become uh, it's basically helium. a very dense star consisting only of carbon and oxygen carbon um, and oxygen mainly. okay that's all that's and it's not burning that anymore but it is still uh, there's still a lot of heat in there and so it's slowly cooling down so it's light and it's a light that slowly dies out and it slowly dies out but in the <coughs> process of that cooling down the interior will at some point actually crystallize oh yeah and this means that you will uh, get a tempor diamond temporarily uh, the uh, the cooling down stops, and this creates a particular feature in the observations that Gaia does. Ah, yeah. And this was exploited by them to show that now for the first time, this was predicted 50 years ago, that white dwarfs would crystallize, and this is the first time you can really clearly see it in the distribution of luminosity versus color of these, uh, wow. of these stars. Is, is this the diamond stars? That, uh, that is the, you is could, that what yes. You could I call it a diamond? Call it a diamond <laughs> Can yeah. I please call it a diamond star? Go there ahead. are diamonds, <laughs> huge well, diamonds the size of small stars. Super bl blood wolf moon. Well, so I get to talk about my diamonds in space. Diamond stars. Oh, I lo but I Feel love free. the idea that there's, there's <laughs> massive, massive, massive diamonds just floating out. I have space. this question. Um, when you collect data on uh, the location and the movement of stars, mm -hmm. um, I think in principle you might be able to uh, wind back the tape and find out which stars have co co collided in the past with other stars. Is that an application of this data set? Yes, uh, so uh, we can do it both in the past and in the future. Uh, so one uh, popular application is to look for stars that are going to pass very close to the sun. Uh, yeah. And we know of one particular star, it's called uh, GJ710, 
not a particularly okay. romantic name. No. Um, and that star uh, comes uh, will come to within about 20,000 astronomical units uh, from the Sun, uh, about one and a half million years from now is the prediction. And that's how many Pluto orbits? And well, for Pluto instance? is at 40 uh, astronomical units. Um, okay. But a so better comparison is the Oort cloud of comets, which sits at 50,000 yeah. astronomical units. So it will actually go through the Oort cloud. Okay. And, and is, this is a star we're talking about? Yes, a star. Yeah, yeah. But w how bright will that be on our night sky? It will just about be the brightest star. Uh, not quite. What? So it won't yeah. be but, very it's, but it's a star a, almost a like coming to visit us. Yes, but it's a very small star. <laughs> I, want, I want a double, I want a no night. <laughs> anyway, I just want to be able to read books by at night. Yeah, that won't happen, unfortunately. Oh, it's, the star is, uh, is so... Um, uh, it's so much less massive than the sun that also it's very dim compared to the sun. So it will brighten, of mm -hmm. course, as it as it approaches us. Yeah. And it will be almost, I think, the brightest star in the sky, but I think not quite. Cool, I, I cool. tried to calculate it, but... <laughs> but yeah. that's, that's interesting. But, but, there's a, there's, but it, all, it tells you how huge the distances still are. Yeah, of no. course. But it, it also, it is, it's such a great example of like almost a minuscule detail that you can find out about these stars. Like that this, the Gaia mission is is, is trying to give you these, these answers to these li really large questions about how the Milky Way works, but also gives you like these crazy little stories about yep. like, oh yeah, the star is coming to visit our solar system. And that's in how many years, by the way? <laughs> uh, about one and a half million years. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> yeah, well, it'll take <laughs> a while, time. it'll take we a while, yes. <laughs> Here's another question. Um, where's my 3D model of the Milky Way? Um, uh, that's being uh, worked on. This oh, is yeah? something that is not, oh, that's uh, n actually not so straightforward to, uh, to figure out from the Gaia data. Um, although we have parallax measurements, um, the fact that they have errors on them uh, make the um, uh, statistical interpretation of these measurements uh, more difficult. So formally speaking, you can say that the distance to a star is simply one divided by the parallax. Uh, and that works fine if you have uh, small errors, but if the errors become a bit larger, which they are for most of the stars, yeah. Uh, then uh, you have to be careful of making this inversion and the statistical interpretation of exactly how far away the star is becomes more complex. And so, uh, for example, uh, measuring where the spiral arms are in the Milky Way, it's in principle possible with Gaia, at least for the ones in the neighborhood of the Sun, um, turns out to be uh, quite, uh, quite difficult still. You need to select uh, primarily uh, blue stars that are located in these spiral arms, but then you need to be able to correct for the effect of dust which we can only roughly do with Gaia, and it's not, not very good yet. These stars tend to be typically far away, and that makes inferring the accurate distances a bit harder. So, so getting a very crisp, uh, clear picture of the spiral arms is still going to take, uh, take some time. But somebody's working on that. But there is work being done uh, on this, yeah. Hey, and, and what's, what's Gaia Sky then? I see Gaia Sky 1.0, yeah, that so software. That software can indeed be used to uh, actually make uh, 3D movies of, uh, of the space around us, of where this, because we know where all the stars are. That's what awesome, yeah. there we go. Yeah. Um, and, Gaia and, Sky. But this is, of course, not a, a scientific uh, model, and it works well for things near to us, where, where the distances are, are uh, very reliable. But this could be a huge tool in the popularization of science, yes, so of we astronomy. Have, we have used it, in fact, for... Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a tool that was developed uh, as part of the work of this uh, data yeah. processing consortium. And you could even incorporate it in, into outreach. a computer game, for instance. Uh, yes, I mean, like this. A, I think this thing oh. can export uh, everything in, in VR format or... Yeah, uh, it, has a, it has a 3D function as yeah. well, and a virtual reality uh, function. Yeah. Whoa, yes. so you can stand inside the Cosmic Milky Way. Cosmic Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> Cosmic Grand Theft Auto, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so this and the software <laughs> is, is open source and free. People can download it and play with it themselves. That will be my next the question. The, the data also are um, uh, public domain? Yes, the data are publicly available. Um, and as I said before, without any proprietary rights for the consortium. So we don't get to use the data first and then the rest. It's all immediately public. Great. And also for the general public, uh, you can go to the Gaia archive. Uh, the, all you have to do is to ask for an account, which you, yeah. you know you get uh, just like that. And you and know, uh, um, having a three D model, uh, actually, I was was just thinking about kicks, moving around between the stars. Yeah. But um, you can be an uh, amateur astronomer using these data just as well as you can be an yes. amateur astronomer having a telescope in your backyard. That's right. Yeah, and you can you can do your own uh, analysis. So one, one, actually, one of the people. Uh, doing a lot of effort on trying to map the Milky Way out to large distances, uh, is uh, an, an amateur uh, astronomer. He's a mathematician of origin, he, and he runs the site galaxymap.org. 
um, and that's where you can find lots of material on the mappingmap.org. We'll yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to find the name of the one of the. I have I have a uh, an app um, or uh, the, the software at home on my computer at home. It's not on my laptop. That, that where you can play around with with just anywhere in the solar system. You can create solar systems. You can destroy them and and etc. Um, but I, I believe that when it comes to the Milky Way, they never have an accurate uh, depiction of it because they they don't know. So it's it's very cool. Like maybe you can yeah. send your data over to them that they that they. Uh, I'll look up the name mm -hmm. as well. Sure. Uh, of this that 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 maybe you can, yeah, like you said, gamify this whole thing. That'd be great. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, how much data are we talking about actually? Because you're sending this is all open, but is this is this like a terabyte or what are we talking yeah, about? Yeah, if you were to download the full uh, Gaia DR2 uh, sort of second data release catalog, it would be about 550 gigabytes compressed. Okay. So once uncompressed, it's about a terabyte. So not prohibited. Oh. Fits on an external hard drive. Yeah. No, not bad. Yeah, but if but you would, if, if as a database, I was expecting more. The problem yeah. is, of course, to efficiently access the data. Um, it's not so much in terms of volume, but then when you say, okay, I, I want to have that specific star or that group of stars, then it needs to be in a database, and that's where a lot of effort has to go yeah. mm -hmm. uh, into to make it uh, efficient and usable. And and maybe a bit of a technical question, but um, in what kind of format are these data? Can a regular person uh, yeah, so uh, use files, it at all? So the files that you can download are available in um, comma-separated format, so the, what you oh, would yeah. use for Excel, but I, I wouldn't attempt to load it into Excel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Overload. Um, but what you typically do is you go to the Gaia archive, and that uh, there's a database in which all the data sits, and you can basically make a, a SQL query. Mm -hmm. uh, and then say I want stars of a specific kind or between certain limits in distance or certain limit in brightness. You can make all kinds of selections. Uh, the data will be <coughs> stored on your local storage space at the at the archive, and then you can download that da data, and that can be done in various formats. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and because that's often a much, much smaller subset, uh, then you could, in principle, load it into Excel if you wanted to work with that as an analysis tool. Uh, typically, what uh, astronomers would use is a uh, so-called virtual, virtual observatory table format, uh, which allows us to interchange also with all kinds of other uh, surveys uh, spread around yeah. the, the web. Yeah. Um, and FITS is another popular, uh, very astronomy-specific format that's very efficient, etc. Mm -hmm. But there is various formats that you can use to download yeah. the data. I, I, f I found the game. Uh, it's, it's a universe sandbox, too. And you have Space Engine. I have them both, and they're both sort of the same idea. Both are a Universe different. Sandbox. Universe Sandbox and Space Engine. Space Engine. And yeah, yeah, yeah. They're super cool to work with. Okay. Um, but when you're talking about that data set, you already said that you have certain elements of these stars that you save. But just to bring it back for my own understanding, if you if we have one star, uh, what do you know, and how much, how would that translate translate to bytes? Just simply, is this like a almost like a word document per per um, like a one-page document per star that we know of it, or how many data points do you have for this one? Well, in the in the star? current in the current catalog, we have the position of the star, so that's two uh, two coordinates uh, mm -hmm. where it is in the sky. We have the brightness of the star, we have the parallax, we have the two components of proper motion, so how it's moving across uh, the sky. We measure that in two uh, directions. Uh, we have the radial velocity, so how fast it's moving uh, in the line of sight. Um, those are the very basic uh, That's just things a couple about of numbers just a couple, just of, couple of numbers yeah. but for each of those numbers we have also errors on those numbers because it's a scientific ah, database okay now you're talking we have the uh, colors of the star that's three numbers so we have the brightness in three different uh, bands again with uh, with errors uh, on them uh, we have estimates for the effective temperature uh, for the for the amount of extinction in the line of sight for the way the star's color was changed by the dust uh, mm -hmm. between us and the and the star uh, and also radius, luminosity, and all these numbers come with error estimates uh, on top of them. So I think in the end, uh, you're talking about uh, over 100 uh, columns in the in the database Ooh. per mm. star. So it is it is sizable, and this is only yeah. a subset of all the data we'll eventually uh, publish. And will then supercomputers just will they start making uh, more of Crunching, like, the yeah, crunching the numbers, <laughs> mathematical m models of the Milky Way. Is that how this this will continue, yes. or how, where will this go? Um, so, so the analyses can be can be very varied. So it might be that you're interested in just one star. 
So, for example, lots of people working on exoplanets uh, are making use of Gaia data because it's important to know the distance to the star because then you have a better estimate of the size of the star and that gives you a better estimate of the size of the planet. If you're looking at planets that go in front of the star and dim the light a bit, so the transiting planets, you need to know, really need to know the, the distance. So that's very simple. You just look it up and, and you use it in your research. On the other end of the uh, scale, of course, are people who say, well, I, I actually want to analyze the uh, collective of stars. So uh, let's say all the stars for which we have the full motion. So these, these are the 7 million stars that have a radial velocity measured. Um, and these can, in principle, be modeled all together, where you indeed build a model of the Milky Way. And with that model, you can predict the statistics of the motions of the stars. You cannot predict each and every individual star how it moves, but you can say that on average stars move uh, with about 200 kilometers per second uh, around the Milky Way, and then the spread in the velocities has a certain value. And you can also predict uh, the, the spread in different directions with respect to the Milky Way itself. And all of that, of course, has to fit with the, with the data. So if it doesn't fit with the data, you might want to change something in your model. Um, and if your model is good enough, you just fix the parameters according to the data, you're done. And sometimes you learn that the whole model is just not it's just not yeah, working yeah. and you need to go to something more complex, etc. Yeah. Uh, and no. that requires a lot of computational power depending on how you analyze the yeah. data. Um, I have a question about precision. Mm -hmm. um, I read somewhere the precision, precision uh, of the Gaia measurements is like distinguishing a euro coin on the moon mm -hmm. from the surface of the Earth. Yes. And someplace else I read using Gaia you could even watch a hair grow on the moon. That's slightly more precise, even, even so than which a euro of coin. Those is correct. I think the watching the hair grow is from. Uh, um, I, I cannot do it off the top of my head, but that must be from a much closer distance. <laughs> okay, <laughs> closer but, from yeah. the Earth. To but the euro yeah. coin on the moon is correct. So, so w the way we measure the precision of Gaia is by talking about the um, angles that it can measure uh, on the sky. So yeah. Because the only thing you do is look at the direction to a star. And directions are always specified in angles. So how far is it above the horizon? How far is it east or west? Um, and we do it in a slightly different way, but you measure those angles. And Gaia can measure angles. Uh, the most precise uh, angles it can measure is 10 micro arc seconds. Uh, now an arc second, micro arc second. Uh, yeah. is if you divide a degree by 60, you have 60 arc minutes and each arc minute is divided in 60 into 60 arc and seconds. And one degree is about the diameter of the moon as we The moon is it, half right? a degree. Half, half a degree. Half a degree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. the moon is uh, about 1800 arc seconds and Gaia measures 10 micro arc seconds. Um, and, and so, so that's uh, and micro is a millionth, a millionth of, of an of what an you're arc talking second. about. And yeah. so that that indeed translates. <coughs> if you take a euro coin, uh, which is about two centimeters in diameter, it's like an American quarter, a little yeah, and little you smaller, put it on the moon, <laughs> yeah. and you could see the moon. You could actually see it from Earth on, lying on the moon. Then you would have eyes that would be capable of measuring angles of yeah. ten micro arc yeah. seconds. Yeah. So. Um, you told us um, Gaia has also charted some um, asteroids. Mm -hmm. You ought to be able to um, um, dis distinguish uh, lots of details on the surface of those asteroids, but Gaia doesn't do that, does uh, no, it? No, no, no. So the, the, the telescopes of Gaia are about one and a half meter diameter. Mm -hmm. So uh, they are sl smaller actually than the mirror that the Hubble Space Telescope uh, carries. Um, and uh, we cannot uh, see surface details because the only thing uh, we we see is a is a point source. Uh, okay, so Gaia so just says, uh, I see a light source there, and I'm going to yeah. watch it for a while and see how it behaves. Yes, that's all it does. Yeah. And I, I I know we're nearing the end of our show, but I still got an important question. <laughs> I, I think yesterday we were on the phone quickly to say hello mm -hmm. for this show, and I think you told me something about. Um, the fact that you can already, the, the, like what the results already have, like what new insights do we have through Gaia? I think you said something that you can see that um, we swallowed up certain certain parts. That, that sometimes there's like clusters in these in these side arms that 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 then of the show, galaxy, yeah, of 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 the galaxy that where, where you can see that we maybe that over there there's like a blob that that supposedly it's not supposed to be there because it was added somewhat later to. Yeah, to so the Milky Way. Um, uh, 
let's let's go. Let me see. I think I can find that. Uh, it, it, I I compare this bit to try to understand. And Anthony, correct me if I'm wrong. That almost as if you have a, a oh. whirl, whirlpool of, of of water, and it's just clear. Yeah. And somebody drops in some paint, and you can sort of see that there's like a a, a separate entity yeah and the pain becomes a spiral itself and it becomes a spiral itself or at yeah. least a blob or something that's yeah. that's inside there is that is that compar comparison slightly uh, is that a good metaphor let me for try what to from? show what i explain i don't have internet here so i can't look up that particular oh yeah uh, here comes animation, another graph but I'll just, <laughs> okay. uh, no, we can work on the show notes in the uh, in, in, in the me in the meantime <laughs> you <laughs> universe that, yeah. sandbox uh the, the upside down mushroom a picture of gaia <laughs> yeah I got the Gaia app, um, <laughs> Gaia Sky 2.0, galaxymap.org. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here's uh, here's what I was talking about yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, if you look very far out in the halo of the Milky Way, uh, with the aid of Gaia data, you can isolate the so-called streams of stars. So you see a very long, thin uh, distribution of stars here. Thousands of stars. Uh, and these stars are essentially all moving on the same uh, orbit. So they're all moving in the same direction. And what this is, this used to be a small galaxy and uh, it fell into the Milky Way and it uh, w went in orbit around the uh, center of the Milky Way, but far out. And because of the uh, gravitational forces of the Milky Way, this uh, galaxy was ripped apart. And, it's, right, uh, yeah. it, and then it becomes a sort of a spaghetti spread out along its own uh, orbit. That's, and that's the drop of ink in yeah, the, the sink, in the, in the kitchen yeah. sink. Yeah. Yeah. Roughly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you see here. But if you look at it in detail, you see that there are sometimes gaps uh, or certain uh, features in there that are not exactly corresponding to a nice uh, stream of stars. And uh, we think that these gaps can be, uh, or we know that these gaps can in principle be caused if a massive object passes close to that stream. It uh, disturbs the orbits of some of the stars and yeah. that appears as a gap on the sky. Now for this particular stream, which is called uh, GD1, uh, after the people who uh, found it first, um, they've uh, determined that uh, what disturbed this, uh, this particular uh, stream happened about uh, 300 to 400 million years ago. And it was an object of about 5 million times the mass of the sun. Now, then they started looking for, okay, what could that be? Is it maybe a globular cluster that we already know, which passed by, but they looked at all the orbits of globular clusters. 500 million, so, so a black hole five, is? 5 million. 5 million, uh, No, okay. sorry, 500 million. 500 sorry. million, years yeah. ago. So, yeah. so it, it, it oh. cannot be a globular cluster, at least not one of the known ones. Uh, it's not one of the known dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way. So they speculate that this could be the first time that we see uh, a massive object which consists completely of dark matter, so it has oh, no wow. stars inside it. And it's been predicted for a long time that our halo should have, um, so the halo uh, consists largely of dark matter. There are stars, of course, but uh, the most of it, the mass is in dark matter. But it's not smoothly distributed. The prediction is that it uh, has substructures, so there's lots of small uh, dark matter uh, uh, blobs actually running around. And these are just concentrations of dark matter uh, particles. And, they, and it's possible that this is the first evidence we have of, of such a thing. This is still this still cool. needs to be confirmed. It might be that we s manage still to find some other object with stars in it that caused this disturbance. Yeah. But it's uh, still it's a nice very to have this little result. preview of research results. Yeah, yeah what, what's been, coming, right? Because it will take years, years and years and years, maybe even decades, to plow through all this and and, and draw decades, a conclusion. For sure. yeah. yeah, decades for sure. It's fascinating Lovely. mission, Anthony. It's 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 amazing. It's so cool that that. We sort of started to to map the Milky Way. What will be the next? What will be the the one that ups it again with a thou factor thousand? That's hard. <laughs> that's that's really hard. Uh, we have been uh, thinking about this, but if if you really want to go, uh, let's say uh, a nano arc second uh, precision, so uh, another nano, factor a of micro, a, but nano, uh, yeah, or or even if you want to go ten nano arc seconds precise. Um, if you want to use the same principle, you would have to scale up the satellite to having a configuration of different satellites because it has to be uh, uh, yes. the, the the size of the mirror effectively has An to be much artificially larger. Artificially big satellite. And you can do, yeah. you do that with interferometry. Uh, so that's extremely expensive and very hard to, to do right. So it's not clear this can be done. Sounds like a good challenge. And another aspect <laughs> is that uh, if you the, for the measurements that we do with Gaia, we have to worry about the fact that the sun uh, bends the light of stars that comes from, uh, from, oh, from outer space. Oh, you have to take that into account. And we have to take it into account all over the sky, not only for stars near the limb of the sun. 
And in fact, we have to take into account the light bending by Jupiter, Saturn, all the major planets. That's incredible. Uh, sometimes even if an asteroid is close enough to a star and it's massive, you, you have to correct for this. That's crazy. Now, if you go down to nano arc seconds, this becomes a much larger problem because then yeah. you really have to worry about knowing exactly where all the um, uh, bodies in the solar system are to make these corrections to sufficient accuracy that you're not constantly the... the the position measurement of the star is not constantly being blurred, as it were, by, by light bending effects. So there are also some fundamental, and it's a couple of other fundamental problems that we would have to tackle before you could get uh, to those accuracies. Yeah. Well, f let's first start crunching that Gaia data then. That's right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anthony, for being That's here. It was great. really Pleasure. wonderful. Really great to finally to do, a sh to, I mean, it's a privilege to do a full show on this because Gaia, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's one of the greatest missions there is, I think. So thank you very much, Anthony. And we All wish right. you lots of success yes. thank you. working on this. And thank you to our listeners as well. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash space cowboys to that. support this show. Herbert Blankenstein, thank you so much. Thais Roos, yes. thank you too. And Thanks to everybody who's helping out and all the listeners. Uh, soon we're going to be... Uh, so you can follow us on uh, YouTube uh, and, and Spotify. Twitter. And every, uh, Twitter. Space, at Space Cowboys Pod on exactly. Twitter. Exactly. And uh, we're working on uh, getting a live stream uh, fixed. Who knows? Maybe in the future, in the next few episodes, we'll announce a live stream on YouTube coming up. Working on it. Working on it. Thank you, Thijs. Thank you, Herbert. Everybody, see you next Space Cowboys podcast. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.